G'day, I'm Sean, and this is an introduction for SUP 1.1, our first major firmware update for the Alexa 35. Software Update Package 1.1 is downloadable now at our website. You can head to arri.com slash SUPS, Software Update Packages, where we have a full list of the most current software versions available for all of our products that require software updates. Now, I have to stress, before you do the software update, please go and read the release notes. The release notes are available in the same place. They have the update instructions, which uh, we get quite a few questions about because there are two files to download and they need to go into different areas on the USB stick. So go and read the release notes. It's also where you'll find a rundown of all the new features and some bug fixes that we've implemented, as well as the existing known issues, which you should be aware of if you're taking an Alexa 35 onto set. So what are the new features? Well. The big one is probably a new recording format. We also have a bunch of new user buttons. We have some new information available as status components in the SCI overlays. And we are introducing a new method to help onset colorists get the most out of Log C4 images when you're sending them wirelessly. So our new recording format is called ArriRaw 3.8K 16 by 9 UHD. And it's been designed for people who want to record exactly a UHD image that would be the same as your delivery format, but in ArriRaw. In order to do that, we crop in the sensor from 4.6K to 3.8K. So it's a little less wide than shooting some of the other larger formats. But again, it's going to allow you to reduce your data rate if you need to record for a UHD deliverable and also want all the advantages of Arri Raw. Maximum frame rates. Well, if you use the one terabyte Codex Compact Drive, you can get up to 65 frames per second. And if you use the faster two terabyte Codex Compact Drive, you can achieve up to 120 frames per second in that recording format. We've updated the recording formats poster, which along with the data sheet is now available on the Alexa 35 webpage. That's arri.com slash Alexa 35. All right, let's talk about user buttons. We're introducing four new user buttons in SUP 1.1, and I'll walk you through them now. So if you go into the menu and then scroll down to user buttons, under camera user buttons, you'll see that I've got them pre-selected. So starting at the top, VF check HDR. Well, that's a toggle user button where you can toggle between the SDR and the HDR modes of the viewfinder. Now that's just the eyepiece on this MVF2. It's not the flip out display as well. But you can choose between the SDR image where you can set your own brightness value and the HDR mode of the viewfinder, which puts it into a 500 nits peak brightness display mode, which is nice and contrasty and a good reference for HDR when you know you're going to head into a grading suite and finish in HDR. The next user button is for VF processing, and that's very similar, but it also adds Log C4 to the mix. So you can then toggle between SDR, HDR, and a Log C4 image in your viewfinder. The third button I have here is Audio Solo. Now that's just going to mute all of the audio channels except the one that you select so that you can hear exactly what's happening on one channel of audio, maybe one speaker in an interview setup. And when you do that, you get a little display here on the SDI status components, as well as in your viewfinder and on the flip out monitor. And you can see this cute little ear icon that pops up. And when I press that again, it will toggle the ear through the different channels to tell you which one is being soloed. And when I get to the end of my four audio channels, I press it again to go back to monitoring all of them at the same time. The fourth user button, I think is pretty cool. So I'm gonna set it up here for you. If you press button four for me, and then scroll down to the FPS preset option. Now, when you press that, you get presented with a little dialog box where you can put in a custom frame rate. I'm partial to the 33.333 frames per second speed. And here you can see that it now says FPS preset and then that frame rate. So if I press the button, it will automatically flip the camera into that predefined frame rate. 
and I can press it again to go back to 24 frames per second. You can set up multiple user buttons with different frame rates. So I've set user button 5 to go to 120 frames per second, and it's kind of like the Amira where you had a dedicated hardware switch for frame rate, and I think especially in doco situations, that's going to be a lifesaver for a lot of DPs. There are eight new features that all relate to providing you with more information about the status of the camera and a couple of new control input methods. Two of those pertain to the side display and we've added a really highly requested feature here which is the ability to go into playback mode. So if you scroll across to that little play icon and click the jog wheel, the camera will go into playback. From here, you can click once again to play back the most recent clip and you can adjust the speed that you are playing the clip back at with the jog wheel. Press once more to go back to be able to select a different clip, so either the previous clip or the next clip. There's no clip list support, but I think it's still a really welcome feature, especially if you're running the camera without a viewfinder and you need to quickly check the last take. To get out of playback, scroll to the right so that you get back to the top menu and click in. Now the camera is back in standby mode. And then I can take you to the second feature, which is to scroll over to the system page. And at the bottom there, there's a version info display. Now this will tell you the firmware versions that the camera and the MVF2, the lens mount and the media that's inside the camera or the version that they're all running at. So it's basically camera and related attached components. Now this is a really nice tool for camera assistants and for prep techs in rental houses I think who just need to make sure at a glance that the camera is all set up and running the latest software. All right, let's look at the viewfinder. We've added two new information panes in the MVF2 menus. So if you go into the frame rate menu, the FPS menu up here, you'll see that we've added a little box which tells you what the maximum frame rate that the camera is capable of recording in depending on the recording format that you have already selected. And because the camera is currently recording in ARRI RAW, I have a different frame rate available for both drives. So the one terabyte drive can manage up to 65 frames a second and the two terabyte 120. And it's letting me know that I have a two terabyte drive in the camera because the two terabyte selection there is in bold. The other little information pane that we've added is in the playback menu. So if I go into playback and then go into the clip list, you can see that there's now all this information about the clips that have been previously recorded. So I get my codec choice, my resolution, my frame rate, what texture was chosen, and then underneath that we have the look file that was active in the camera when the clip was recorded. But at the moment that default look is greyed out because I have a different look that's now active in the camera. And the camera will play back the footage with whatever look is currently active. So if I scroll up one clip, you can see that the fashion look library look was active for that clip and that's currently what I now have active in the camera, so it's not greyed out. So just bear that in mind when you're playing back. The first change that we've made to the SDI status overlays is to include an indicator for what texture file you currently have active in the camera. So here in the cam section, you can see that I have the L345 texture enabled, which is the shadow texture. K445 is the four digit code for the default texture and you can check out what all the other codes relate to in the texture menu of the Alexa 35. The second change that we've made is that we've now brought back the depth of field indicator that was on previous cameras but up until now missing from the Alexa 35. So if you go into the menu and then into monitoring, SDI, SDI processing, in this case for SDI1, under the overlays section and status components, I can scroll down, I can turn on lens data, which has always been there, so I get my t-stop and my focal length information, and then I can set my lens focus distance, and now my depth of field. So now I get the near and the far limit of the depth of field as calculated by the camera. And to do that calculation, the camera needs a circle of confusion value and you can select from a number of those different types of values in the lens and ECS menu on the camera. The third change to SDI is that we have implemented an SDI2 clone function. So that's where you set the SDI2 feed on the camera to clone whatever is happening on SDI1. If we go back now into the monitoring settings, I can scroll down and in the SDI2 image menu, I can choose between clean, 
processed or clone STI1. So that bit hasn't changed. But what has changed is that instead of completely cloning the whole image pathway, where you basically just have one STI com signal coming out of two outputs on the camera, now it's just cloning the settings of SDI1. And that brings about some interesting possibilities. So if you have set a user button, which would just adjust a setting for SDI2, even if SDI2 is set to clone SDI1 and you press the user button, it will only affect the SDI2 output because it's just the settings that have been cloned and not the whole image pathway. In a similar way, you can have a bit of a shortcut when you're setting up what features you would like to display with your status components, for example, on the SDI outputs by setting up SDI1 first, adjusting all of your processing settings and your overlays, and then going to the SDI2 image menu, selecting clone SDI1, and then selecting processed. When you do that, it will keep all of the settings that it had been cloning, and then you can make small adjustments. So if you wanna have two SDI outputs that are very, very similar, but say the focus puller wants to have the depth of field information and the director doesn't wanna see that, well, you can very quickly clone them and then set one back to process so that you can make a very slight change that will only be on SDI2, for example. Another new feature in SUP 1.1 is called Wireless Video Optimized Log C4. And it's basically a new SDI processing setting which you can enable in the camera to make the images that are sent from a wireless video transmitter in Log C4 look better when you start doing onset coloring. So this is only really applicable to people who are working in environments with onset colorists who need their images sent wirelessly. And there is a full technical note about this which is available in the Learn and Help section and then technical documentation on our website. And if you need more information, I strongly recommend reading this paper as it's been written by our image science and product management departments and it lays out all the very finicky details. I'm just gonna try summarize it very quickly for you. So if you go into the camera menu and then you go into the image menu under look, you would normally have the option between look and log C4 for these two SDI processing settings. And now you'll see we have a third option here. Now to demonstrate what that does, well, if I just enable log C4, we get the log C4 image here. Now that's you know, not a video signal, so it's quite dark, it's quite low contrast and low saturation. If I change this to wireless video optimized log C4, you'll see that the image gets brighter. Now, the one trick here is that you should never actually be looking at this image. This is designed so that the image encoding that happens in the wireless video transmitter preserves as much of the quality of the log C4 signal as possible, but it requires that you use a LUT at the other end of the chain. So we now have a pack of LUTs, which are called the WVO2 log C4 LUTs. And the signal flow should be that you have wireless video optimized log C4 set to your SDI output that is connected to your transmitter. And then at the receiver, you have maybe an inbuilt LUT in your receiver and you would use a wireless video optimized two log C4 LUT in your receiver so that then your you know, color pipeline and everything you're doing with your onset color workflow is then receiving a standard log C4 signal so that your show LUT works and you can make your CDL adjustments and do whatever you need to do as an onset colorist. So it's kind of this image we're seeing here of the wireless video optimized log C4 should never be seen on a monitor. It's kind of something that is only actually occurring in the air between the transmitter and the receiver and you use the LUT to go back to log C4 either in your, in your receiver or in your onset color workflow cart, for example. Again, if you need the technical detail, go and check out our technical note on the website. Last but not least, there are a bunch of other smaller improvements as well. Some of those relate to Wi-Fi. So the camera will now tell you if you still have the default Wi-Fi password of Ari Ari set. And that's because anyone who knows the default password can theoretically log onto any camera that they see if the Wi-Fi is active. So please go and set a custom Wi-Fi password. The camera will also now select an automatic Wi-Fi channel so that it doesn't conflict with the ECS radio channel that you might have already chosen. 
And in the network settings, you can also now select a static gateway, which will help if you have the camera plugged into a different Wi-Fi router. We've also made some nice improvements to the sync shift settings. So in the camera, if you go into the menu and into system and then into sensor, you'll see that there's a sync shift option. And there's now a little UI that will tell you how many lines on your monitoring output you are shifting by adjusting the timing of the sensor readout relative to the Genlock input. Now, that's a little complicated, but it's really useful for virtual production when you're trying to minimize artifacts that the camera might be recording due to timing issues with the screen. So that interface, if you've used it before, has now greatly improved and will hopefully make it an easier job to correct those sync offsets. We've also implemented a bunch of bug fixes. For example, we used to have a bug where the time code would be offset by one frame in jam sync mode when you change the camera into an enhanced sensitivity EI setting. That's now been fixed. We also have better support now for slash eye protocol that's commonly found in Cook and some Zeiss lenses. And we've also improved the roll indicator here the horizon indicator, which is quite nice. It's now a little green dot when it's centered and white when it's not. So that's been improved. And you'll also find the metadata associated with tilt and roll in this camera has also been greatly improved. You can find lots of information about all the bug fixes that we've implemented, as well as the existing known issues on the release notes, which of course you can download from ari.com slash sups. All right, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.